Hey, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the Sigma 50mm art lens. Now this is perhaps the best value for money lens in terms of 50mm focal length that you can buy. I've shot with a host of them, I've used the Zeiss lenses, I've used the Canon L, the cheap and cheerful Nifty 50, I've gone through the whole range of available lenses for Canon. And this is the best. It's not the best in terms of overall performance, but in terms of the price and how much great image quality you get, it is the best. If you want absolutely all in, empty bank account money, sort of 50 millimeter lenses, you're looking at the Zeiss Otis or the Zeiss 1.4 manual focus lens. They are better than this, but their price tag is astronomical. Now chances are, if you're watching this video, you're wondering, should I be buying the Sigma Art or should I be buying the own brand 50 millimeter lens for my camera? From all the 50mm lenses that I've tried and played with that belong to the own brand, so Canon, Nikon, Fuji, whatever it may be, the Sigma outperforms them. So if you don't need to watch the rest of the video, trust me, these are great. But what I've done, I've taken some test shots. I'm gonna jump onto this computer now and show you what I've shot, what you can see, and what sort of performance you can expect from this lens. I'm then gonna go through my portfolio and show you how I've used it in my professional work to create certain looks and feels. Okay, so the way that I've shot these, I have used available light, and it was quite dim, so we've got very long um, shutter speeds. This is a 20 second shutter speed. Because when I lit it with flash, every image looked great. Now I've shot from f1.4 all the way down to f16, which is as far this lens goes, which might be relevant to you because a lot of lenses go down to f22 or f32. First of all, just as our overall view, we're just gonna flick through these, you can sort of see the way the lens renders. Now, if you are a bokeh person, this probably isn't the lens for you because the background's a little bit messy. Now, I've not taken every aperture within here because a lot of them, there's very little difference between. But if you go all the way back down to f1.4, you can see it vignettes quite heavily. Now, for me personally, that's not a problem. I like vignetting, especially when shooting wide open. It adds to the soft, dreamy sort of aesthetic. But as soon as you stop down to 1.6, look at the difference here between the vignettes. Then it's even better at 1.8, f2, f2.2 is really good. Not much difference there. By f2.8, I think this lens is almost as good as it gets and it stays great through f4 all the way to f8 where it starts to fall apart a bit. Now, let's dive in and do some pixel peeking. So back down to 1.4, let's zoom in on this. Now these are JPEGs that I've just rendered out. Um, they were shot in raw, did a little bit to them just so you correct the colors, and then I've exported them. Now, anyone who's interested in color fringing, we've got greens and purples in all the outer focus areas. This is and isn't an issue. One, yes, you can correct it with the click of a button, but what it does, it leaves this empty space in the image where there's nothing quite right in it. it just it, it doesn't always work. Removing it isn't always the answer. Sometimes it looks better to leave it in. Now, only photographers really care about this. Ask any of your family members, zoom into a picture like this and say, what do you notice about this image? I bet they won't say. I could see green and purple fringing. Now, considering the lens is wide open, I'd say that this is pretty darn sharp. There's not lots in focus. So obviously there's not loads of detail going through, but the bits which are in focus, this is at one to one. I'd say it's pretty good. Now I'm just gonna stay zoomed in here. I didn't move the focus at all, so I'll just flick to the next image. So from this 1.6, 1 1.8, 1 you can see now the sharpness is really starting to come together. And it's just starting to reproduce a bit more detail. Let's just move up here. So as we drop down, oh, what have I done there? I've done something, there we go. Move on to the next image, F2, 2.2, 2.5. And 2.8 and now you can see a massive leap in detail now when i'm shooting six sheets if i'm shooting point of sale this is very important to me this lens at 2.8 you will not find a zoom lens in the world that can cope with this sort of image quality it just won't be able to produce the same image Now, if we move along all the way to f4 and zoom in, this is where the lens gets as sharp as it can. Now, I think I've knocked my, I don't know how I've done this. It's a massive tripod, but I've knocked it a bit. But, but just, just believe me, I'm not going to go reset the shot up because 
I've got a busy week going on. But it gets great round here. And all the way through to F8, the image quality is obscene. Now, this is a very important thing for some of us. If you're a product photographer or someone who needs to get everything in focus when you stop that lens down to F16, the image falls to pieces. This is not motion blur. I've double checked on several shots. This is just the lens not coping being stopped down but it's not designed for that if you need something to shoot at f16 there are better lenses you're probably more likely to want the if you're a canon shooter 45 tilt shift that really copes well with being stopped down that and you don't have to because you can play with a focal plane but it's not great at f16 it's at f2.8 to f8 if you're into clarity and detail but if you're just into beautiful images i think at 1.4 for the price point is pretty darn good now this lens is a big old piece of glass. It is not lightweight. It is much bigger than Canon's own version. Let's see if I can get this in shot. That's the front element of it. It is huge. It is made of very good plastic and lots of metal. It focuses much faster than the 50 millimeter 1.2 or 1.4 from Canon. Can't comment on the Nikons. I've never really used them enough to get a good understanding. If you're a Canon shooter, you'll be pleased to know it comes with a lens hood. A lot of Canon lenses, you have to buy them separately and they're extortionate. But there is a drawback to this. I'm shooting this on the 35 now, which I've used a lot more than the 50. And the 35, this has to be held on by wedging gaff tape in this little gap here. Otherwise, they just wear out and fall off. It's just not a great system. The autofocus switch is the only switch on it. It's nice and positive. It doesn't mess around. The lens itself is built like a tank. It is built for professional use. It's not fully weather sealed like the Canon versions. There's no gaskets. I have shot in the rain with it for maybe three hours and it's been absolutely fine, but I wouldn't, you know, really go for that sort of thing. If I was going to do that, I'd use one of the Canon L lenses. Their zoom lenses seem to be particularly well weather sealed. But for studio work, for food photography, it is great. So what I want to do now is jump back into the computer, go into my website, my portfolio. And I want to show you some images that I've shot with it why I chose the lens and how I used it to achieve this because shooting pineapples is great and it was lovely to eat afterwards, but it doesn't really give you the whole picture. Okay, let's start with the food because this is what I shoot most of the time. Now I actually bought the 50 millimeter, 50 millimeter? That was an odd, odd accent to pull out there. 50 millimeter lens for food a lot. Well, I bought it for food to use it a lot more to the point and I didn't really end up using it that much. Nevertheless, it is great for certain things. This here is shot with this wide open, 1.4. It's lit with flash, which means it does get a lot of detail in there. And it gives you this great, really sort of um, voyeuristic view of the food. You're really close to it. You can get a lot in the frame. I know people say it's a standard lens, but it's slightly wide, in my opinion. It's not a, you know, it's not a flat, undistorted lens. Now, a lot of the images on here are actually shot with medium format at the moment, so there's quite a lot of 45mm focal length, but that's not what we're looking for here. Okay, so here we go again with the 50mm lens. See, it's a little bit distorted. This is quite an old shot, but it is a great lens. It does a great job. This was also shot with it. It's nice. It's sharp. This is the particular aesthetic this restaurant wanted to go for. I think this might be diving out of my portfolio very soon. But it does a great job for food. If you only have one lens in food photography, it should be the 50. This is again shot at wide open at 1.4 because the muscles were the hero here. Everything else was just a bit of extra faff. So it just helps you bring it all together and really isolate what you're trying to showcase to the clients. Again, in this particular shot here, we stopped down to F4 to get the detail in there to really show off what was in the plate. So this is a nice little sort of sharing platter, I guess is the best way to describe it. Now, although I'm a food photographer by trade, I shoot a lot of portraits and I've actually ended up using this 50 millimeter lens more for portraits than anything else. So here we have Brian Blessed and this was shot on the 50 at 2.8. And it's great because you can get really close and really interact with the subject. And I find that being close is a really important thing. But it's slightly wide as well. This is shot from low down, 2.8, so the background's just falling out. It's got a plank of wood hanging off a sea stand behind a paper background here. But you can see how it does distort when you come in close. Now, obviously, it's not going to distort like a 17mm lens like this. But if you come in here, you can see it's soft, it's nice. You've got a nice focus play going on. You have really nice shallow depth of field if you want to. But when you get really close, it enlarges the head. 
So this here is shot with a 50 millimeter lens and this guy here has a similar size head shot with a 90. Now granted I was a little bit closer but you can see how it really accentuates the face and I think that's quite a useful tool. This is with a 50 as well, 1.6, glasses slightly out, eyes bang in focus and it gives you a really intimate insight into a portrait I feel. And again with this lens take a step back and it's pretty wide. You know if I use a 35 for this lens it'd be too wide but for this shot I mean. But this really works well I feel. But then you can also come in close and tight and you can really play with that depth of field. This is a shot for all the bokeh people out there. If you look at the background, they're reasonably round. I don't really care about such things. What's more important to me is the subject. Again, this is my best mate. This is the headshot with natural light. And this was shot at 1.4. And again, it's a great, great lens for this sort of stuff. I actually think it's better for portraits or at least I use it for portraits more than I'd use it for food. So I hope that's of use to you and I hope you can sort of get an idea as to what it's like to live with this lens and you know looking at some test sheets or some DX scores are very useful but they don't tell you the full story. For me this lens is for anybody who can't afford the Zeiss Otis but wants the optimal image quality they can get and it's also slightly budget friendly. Now let's not be under any illusion it's still a lot of money it's not the sort of thing if I lost that sort of cash I'd know about it. But in terms of lenses and looking at the big picture of lenses, it is a great purchase. I don't think anybody could be disappointed with it. The autofocus is fast. I've never had focus problems with any of my Sigma lenses. I have had problems with my camera bodies though. I have one camera body which is minus eight on every single lens. So I think when you're reading about people saying, oh, the lens back focuses, whatever it may be, just remember they might not have had six of the same camera body which have all been looked at and you've realized that one camera body's out. And if you only owned that one camera body, you'd assume all your lenses are out. So there's a bit more to the story often. So I hope that's of use to you. If you're enjoying these videos, do hit subscribe. I'm going for two to three videos a week at the moment. We're doing one on gear like this, a how-to video, and then some sort of episode thing that I haven't given a name to yet or worked out exactly what it is at the point of filming this. I'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.